If you're type A, you'll find that owning a bandsaw is like polishing a turd. You're just never quite happy with the results it gives. Being financially challenged, I no longer buy the expensive silicon blades. Just these $5 end-of-run carbon blades from a local saw shop. These fancy silicon blades I found cost about five times more and they really don't last a whole lot longer. Sometimes they're, they get dull quicker, so bye-bye. I like to clean the wheels with just a, a stiff bristle brush followed by a rust removing pad. The rough kind, the 3M kind. Works pretty good and doesn't really harm the rubber. Vibration does make a difference, so do your best to isolate any vibration in the drivetrain, especially in the lower wheel. The upper wheel, because it does the steering and the tracking, really needs to be balanced and wobble free. So check it carefully and adjust accordingly. In my opinion, I find blocks are still the best form of bandsaw support. These are the cool blocks or the graphite impregnated blocks and they work exceptionally well. But these blocks do have a few significant drawbacks. For starters, you have to remove them to dress them. They're also consumable, so I use about $11 Canadian worth every year of cool blocks. For dressing the blocks, I don't use any fancy jigs. Just throw the blocks in a vise and file them square. The 45 degree blocks can be kind of a pain in the butt. Because I'm filing freehand, I do actually check each block for 90 degrees. The 45 degree ones are even more of a pain in the butt, but it's got to be done. The blocks are reinstalled but I'm keeping them at the outermost position and I'm only just snugging them up to hold them there. You don't want to yank down or crank down on that too hard. Also, for the sake of anal retentiveness, I make sure that each of the blocks have the grain facing the same way when they're opposing. In reality, it doesn't actually make a difference, but I just feel better about it. This is something I never see addressed in bandsaw reviews. For your blade guide to do its job, it must move perfectly perpendicular to the table and in the same line. I never see this checked for, so check yours out and make sure it is. Alright, so let's throw that shitty blade on and get it nicely centered and running. With the saw running and shining a light behind, let's just see how crappy this blade is. Yep, it's pretty crappy. The biggest causes normally are just the blades themselves and wobble in the wheels. So let's fix that. This is where our old friend the die grinder comes in. You could also probably use a multi-tool, one of those little high-speed Dremels or perhaps even a drill that can turn at 3000 RPM. Try to keep the stone at 90 degrees to the blade and move the stone along the edge. See how I'm doing there, back and forth, to evenly wear the stone? Stop from time to time, back off and check to see if what you're doing actually has an effect. In essence, what we're doing is we're grinding the blade in a dynamic state and trying to create a dynamic datum. Take your time and go slow. We want the blade to be perfectly machined. With a die grinder, this usually takes me about a minute to three minutes, and you're only taking off about a quarter of a millimeter to a half of a millimeter of blade thickness. Here it is from another angle. You can see there's quite a bit of flutter on the blade. But that will eventually disappear with the next step. Let's see if we've made any improvement. Not bad, not bad. 
But for this video, I actually went back and I kept grinding down the blade. Here is something I almost see never addressed in other bandsaw videos. Make sure your blade is set up perpendicular, perfectly 90 degrees to the table, on the back side. Since our blade guide moves up and down at perfectly 90 degrees, our blade must also be perfectly at 90 degrees. If your upper wheel is properly set up and shimmed, the gullets of the teeth will be at the very top of the crown. So the blade won't be riding in the center of the wheel, but the gullets of the teeth will be. Next we're going to grind the side of the blade, not the teeth, just the flat side. A steady hand is required here, so go slow and take your time. Have a look at the way the blade flutters in the video. You can see that it's starting to flutter less and less, or flap less side to side. Let's do the other side. Blade flutter is starting to really subside now. As always, take your time and check your progress. With the saw running, just gently take off the burrs. I use a file. You can also use a stone. Also, you can see that the blade flutter has been significantly reduced from when the blade was brand new. Now that we've taken care of that blade, let's just move the thrust bearing all the way back and adjust the blocks so they're just right behind the teeth. I'm also going to loosen them so they can move freely but not fall out. The block should just be loose enough to move but not fall out while the saw is running. After you've obsessed for this for a while, let's just turn the saw on. For some folks, this next step might be controversial. Here I'm going to do a reach around from the rear. I'm going to grab the blocks and I'm going to squeeze them gently together. This set screw was a little too loose, a little bit too much slop, so I tightened it up a bit. Keep the blocks firmly squeezed together and move the blade from side to side while it's running. What we're looking for here is a natural running position or a position of least friction, where the saw is the most comfortable. Once you've found that, basically by listening to it, tighten down the set screws. Even when rubbing tightly, I've never had a blade even get warm to the touch with cool blocks. Now the lower guides are a different story. They're not going to be as easy to adjust. Here's where I sort of draw the line on safety. They're in a confined space which can lead to quick removal of your finger. So I generally prefer to just rotate the saw by hand and adjust it with the other hand. This isn't optimal, but it works okay. It can be a bit fiddly at times, especially having to reach in there to adjust the blocks. On the lower blocks, I tend to put them a little tighter than the top ones. It doesn't matter, they're cool blocks and they'll wear nicely. Don't waste your time with that dollar bill bullshit or piece of paper crap. You want maximum support. Even when running this tight, I've never had a blade heat up. These carbon blocks are amazing. With the saw running, let's move our thrust bearing inward. Move it inward slowly, just till you can hear it starting to make a noise. Just till the blade starts to touch it, but not till it's turning. I move it in till it's turning just a bit and then back it out when it stops. The thrust bearing should only engage when there's just a slight bit of pressure on the blade when you're pushing the wood into it. Other the rest of the time, it should just skate. 
I don't show it in the video, but you're going to want to adjust the lower thrust bearing exactly the same way. Because we're anal retentive, we're going to check to see if the blade is actually parallel to the guide slot. We're really only checking for gross misalignment here, but if you're out quite a bit, you're going to have to adjust your table. Oh yeah, the pin. Now, let's adjust the fence. A properly adjusted bandsaw fence is adjusted perfectly parallel to the slot. Perfectly in line with the slot. There is no such thing as adjusting for drift with the fence. With this two foot long board, that's perfectly flat on one edge, as you can see on the table. I'm going to rip it and see what my drift is. I'm running the flat edge against the fence, and we're going to test to see the end cut variability. At this end, I'm reading about 1.978. Let's go to the other end. Here I'm getting about 1.979, about a thou, over two feet. Next, I'm going to set my miter gauge at 90 degrees to itself. To test the accuracy, I'm now going to take a piece of wood that has one, of course, perfectly flat edge, and draw a 90 degree line from that flat edge. With our flat edge right against our miter gauge, let's see what our deviation is from that line. Notice that I'm running the upper blade guide in its highest position to provide the least amount of support for the blade. Nice. Next I'm going to use this 6 inch piece of teak. I'm going to draw a 90 degree line from a plane surface and we're going to run it vertically to see how much we're off 90 degrees left and right. Just a tiny bit off. Here I've set up the fence so I'm just shaving off the thickness of the blade curve. The side facing the fence has been planed. So in essence I'm trying to use the bandsaw here as a poor man's planer. Now I'm going to rerun the teak and I've moved the fence in one and a half millimeters. And this is a test to see how thin and how even I can get a sheet of veneer. The teak veneer was acceptable, but I normally don't rip it that thin. I typically use a much thicker, like an eighth of an inch. Here I'm going to run a piece of scrap ash through just as a final test.
Well, I hope you found this video useful. And if you think I'm full of it, just please leave something down in the comments section. I'd like to thank all three people that probably have actually watched this video. Have a great day.